We've got details of these and many more coming up in the next 20 minutes. If you spend your time with me, remember, we're live on DSTV channel 279. On to our very first story. The time wasted in traffic in Accra it is it disturbing, especially on prime roads like the Spintash Road. This can lead to hours of gridlock. One day, the road may flow smoothly, but the next day, a minor incident or construction work can bring the entire road to a standstill. My colleague, Noble Crosby Annan, has the rest of the story. The frustrations of commuters on the Sphinctus Road due to heavy traffic are a tale of daily struggle and exasperation. The road is a major thoroughfare that connects various neighborhoods, commercial areas and industrial zones. Unfortunately, it is also notorious for its perpetual congestion, which significantly impacts the lives of the countless individuals who rely on this road for their daily routine. Now, a five-month traffic interruption of a motorway flyover construction announcement worsened the situation. Every Saturday, there is no traffic in the door. The situation was terrible from Saturday, even on Sunday when the road was expected to be free. Now here all block like motor go south, you don't go get chance pass. Unless you go past like this, uh, go there like this, come past like this. The Ministry of Roads and Highways, acting through the Department of Urban Roads, announced that the flow of vehicle traffic at the southern approach of the Flatport runabout will be interrupted for five months. This period of interruption is to enable the construction of the flyover to progress. The Urban Roads Department, in a statement, noted that routes such as the east and west bound of Spinkters Road, Burma Camp Road, from the Jifat Road, and east and westbound of Matichu Road will be affected. While the roadblocks and diversions frustrated motorists, business was booming for car riders and other vendors. The persistent complaints from commuters prompted the removal of some of the roadblocks, but only for a while. The way traffic in CMs happen in Fono, a bit more between one. I think the traffic frustrated the people in PA who use the road. Military officers also transport money using this route. Fire service and ambulance services also use this route. I think people complain about the traffic situation, but the gridlock can return at any time. For commuters and other road users here at Flaport Junction, their joy may be short-lived, as it is just a matter of when the roads will be blocked again for construction works to continue. Noble Crosby Annan, Flapport Junction, Accra. And the Office of the Special Prosecutor has served notice that it has the power to arrest any person reasonably suspected to have committed corruption or corruption related offences. The advice to the public was issued shortly after a human rights court granted an ex parte motion restraining the OSP from arresting him. Lodi Duasari has more. Citing the Criminal and Other Offences Procedure Act 1960, Act 30, lawyer for Charles Bisu, Nana E.J. Bafuewa, argued the Office of the Special Prosecutor had neither charged or made available any summons for Charles Bisu. He also noted that both parties had another case at the High Court where Charles Bisu was always represented during the hearing, hence cannot be described as a fugitive for which reason he should be labelled as a wanted man by the OSP. Presiding Judge Nicholas Abudakwi, after hearing the submission by counsel for Charles Bisu, granted a 10-day restraining order against the Office of the Special Prosecutor and adjourned the case to June 22. But, reacting to the ruling by the court, the Office of the Special Prosecutor in a statement noted that in the exercise of its police powers, the Office of the Special Prosecutor can arrest without a warrant any person is reasonably suspect of having committed corruption or corruption-related offences. Charles B.C. recently filed a suit at the High Court in an attempt to prevent the Office of the Special Prosecutor from prosecuting him after he was declared a person of interest in the investigation of the activities of the Interministerial Committee on Illegal Mining. He had demanded documents from the OSP backing his investigations. Lord Idrasari, TVC News, Accra. And now the majority in Parliament has hit back other ranking member on the Lands and Forestry Committee, Dr. Rashid Purple to provide proof on how call for the arrest of Gabriel Tridako and Lord Komi can be justified. Majority Chief Whip Frank Anodon Press says the NDC MPs must be responsible in their call. Take a listen. Gabi has, has filed a case in court. 
Okay. It's difficult for me to delve into the merit of this matters. We'll have to be patient until the court decides on this matter. But Rashid Pepo himself is a senior. I met him in Parliament, yeah. and he should know better with respect to him. If you, you know that these people should be arrested, and you should be a responsible citizen to provide reasons why these people should be arrested. Otherwise, everybody gets up every day and says that this person or that person should be arrested. It will be too difficult for a country to, to be treated and handled like that. So I think that Rashid Pepo, with respect to him, should be more responsible and provide some evidence. I will be number one to support him if there are evidence that Lord Kome is involved. I think I'm an environmentalist. Yeah. I have strong views about the environment, yeah. water, vegetation, and how we... Because I think that if the way we are treating the environment, if 10 years back the environment was treated like the way we are doing, we will not have an environment to live in. Mm. Okay. So the soil, the water, and, and the ocean, these are the essence and the bedrock of our livelihood. And we cannot allow these you know, critical aspect of nature to be. You can watch the full interview when you visit our website, is 3 newscom In more news this morning, a former rector of Gempa, Professor Stephen Adai, has defended Professor Kwabena from Pombwaten over his arrest by the Office of the Special Prosecutor. He maintained that the chairperson of the now dissolved Interministerial Committee on Illegal Small Scale Mining has not been treated fairly by the state. I think that some things are going on now that men and women of integrity must speak out. For example, one of the most respected people in this country who have made the greatest contribution on parallel is Professor Kwabra Frimpong Boatin. He writes a report to the head of state that some people are doing wrong and he is arrested and those alleged criminals have not yet been called to be questioned. I believe that we are faced with issues of integrity and political expediency and as a people and as an institute in our capacities this is the time that our voices must be heard because our country will not go far without integrity. Well, if you're just tuning in, you're watching the morning news here on New Day with me, Josh Quinn. We're live on DSTV Channel 27. And let's know what you make of stories that have been aired so far. Go on to our social media platform, Steve Tigana. Engage us now. Families of the five suspects killed in the Botiano shooting incident are opposing to the police service conducting post-mortem of the bodies. The police have initiated moves to have the post-mortem carried out by a pathologist at the, Ghana, uh, the police hospital's morgue, claiming that it is the surest way to determine the actual cause of death of the five deceased suspects. But police insist it will go ahead with the postmortem after it procured and filed the coroner's form with the police hospital's morgue. But the families are vehemently opposing the postmortem because the police in its statement released on June 10, 2023, indicated that the suspects died from gunshot injuries sustained during a shootout on June 8. Out of the five suspects killed, remains of four have been identified by their families, while one person is yet to be identified. The families are also requesting the police to release bodies of their deceased members for burial, but the police have been hesitant. The four are Augusta Nikwe, a.k.a. Weku, Daniel Nikwe, Abraham Tetewayo, a.k.a. Brother, and Joseph Amankwano. The police in its press statement, however, refused to disclose the whereabouts of mobile phones and unspecified cash amount belonging to the suspects. The police, however, admitted custody of their cell phones upon inquiry by family members but denied knowledge of a little bag containing the unspecified money. All items retrieved from the suspects are with the police. We'll continue following up on this very development and finish with update in our subsequent bulletins. Despite the use of technology in enhancing election management under the Fourth Republic, former chair of the Electoral Commission, Dr. Afarijan, has urged caution in its use. Speaking at a roundtable on integrating technology in election management in Accra, he further criticized the Electoral Commission in resorting to regional rather than constituency election coalition centers. My colleague Eric Bowen Egbeta reports. 
Ghana's election management continues to be a growing process from the introduction of photo albums to biometric capture of voters, the journey to make the processes better continues unabated. At the heart of the advancement in technology for election management, however, is to safeguard and engender trust in the results declared. A position backed by former chair of the EC, Dr. Afarijan. It is not desirable to set up many collision points in the results management process. Each collision center represents a point where results can be corrupted. Training election workers well to minimize the possibility of errors. For the current EC, the gains chalked from successive deployment would be enhanced with the use of the Ghana card as a sole document for registration for the next general elections. We are still insistent that let us use the Ghana card so that to address the issue of minors because the, the date of birth is on the card and the citizenship is also on the card. So that will also in a way reduce drastically the rotation of minors and foreigners. Other means like the guarantee system is fought with violence at the police station. And we should not encourage that in this modern technological era when we have Ghana card, solid technology behind that to eliminate age cheating. We in the end are saying that first of all, let's look at the human resource at the electoral commission. Second of all, let's put integrity at the forefront. But for the former EC chair, actions including the resort to regional coalition exercises breeds the perception of bias and laziness in the current commission. It builds confidence in the process. So I think that borrowing that we did from Nigeria by not collecting from at least 275 resource sheets, but from only 16 resource sheets. At the next opportunity, we should reverse it. That's why I said, okay, maybe the letter commission is being lazy. Another ban on the movement of livestock from the Upper East region has led to a shortage in Kumasi. Though the decision is to prevent the spread of anthrax to non-affected areas, livestock dealers say consumers will be at the receiving end due to hikes in prices of the animals should the ban continue. My colleague Emmanuel Somani has more. Ashanti region has not recorded any case of anthrax disease, but livestock dealers and consumers are bearing the brunt of the outbreak. Around this time, when we are inching closer to observing the Muslims' festival of sacrifice, Edo Ada, the various livestock markets get congested. But that is not the case. The ban on movement of livestock from Upper East region is biting. A few animals that we have within the region here is not enough, especially the Idil Hada getting closer. Those animals cannot even feed the kind of people that will be looking for animals to do their, their sacrifices. Many of our peoples cannot do, and even the cost of the cattle will be more. And this year, cattle of 3,000, it can cost 6,000. <laughs> None of our animals has been affected by the disease, but we are facing the consequence of the ban because it has led to a shortage of animals and hikes in prices. We are just hoping things turn around before the Eid celebration. Management of the Kumasi Abatwa says it has intensified surveillance to ensure no affected animal enters the ayat. To make sure we check animals properly, and we carry on what we call the anti mortem. We have the, our veterinary department who are doing the anti mortem inspection for us before we allow the animals in the market for sale. So, people of Ashanti region, you are safe from taking meat that is coming out from the Kumasi Abattoir. The regional veterinary office has asked the public to be cautious of where they buy their meat. In every district, we have a, either a slaughterhouse slaughter slab or slaughter point. In those areas, uh, veterinary activities there are being inspected by our meat, veterinary meat inspectors, together with the environmental health 
officers. So the meat coming from those areas are wholesome. With barely two weeks to celebrate the Edo Ada and in the midst of anthrax outbreak, there has been calls for people to slaughter their animal at an appropriate place for safety purposes. Ibrahim Abubakar, TV3 News, Kumase Abatua. And our chief legal advisor at the Ministry of National Security, Dr. Ose Bonsu Dixon, says development of IT skills will minimize the impact of cybersecurity threats in Ghana. Speaking at an IT skills development in Accra, he noted Ghana could lose millions of dollars annually if gains made in cybersecurity are not consolidated. The International Economic Forum estimates that cybercrime cost the global economy at at least $6 trillion in 2021. This is projected to rise to over $10 trillion by 2025. The typical cyber attack costs $3.86 million, and according to an IBM study, it takes 280 days to identify and contain it. The majority of culprits use fashion and social engineering approaches through social media. The primary weaknesses being exploited by offenders include a lack of understanding of cyber threats as well as insufficient cybersecurity control mechanisms. Ghana had a total of 9,769 interactions as of the end of the third quarter of 2022 of which 431 were genuine cybersecurity incident. According to Chief Legal Advisor at the Ministry of National Security, Dr. Osaibun Sudeksen, the impact of cybercrime can only be minimized if the youth are skilled in cybersecurity. Now, what is the problem in Ghana has to do with the skill set disadvantage? We've moved paces up, but we need to move more. And that's why I'm very happy that they emphasize the gender flair. Because in many other places, it is just uh, we want to train people. But they have at a core of it a gender sensitive uh, dynamic to ensure that the gender divide that has plagued the African continent for far too long is something that will become a misunderstanding. He welcomed the initiative to enhance IT and cybersecurity capabilities and hoped it would change the nation's direction. It, it, it involves training of youth, it involves how schools in Ghana should embed the cyber discipline. We in our country are faced with new prospects. If one looks at it, we have chat GPT, we have a new technology on the horizon. We should internalize it. The program would further improve cybersecurity advocacy and community building. So yes, Cyber One Defense, we are here to solve a problem. And the problem is we are going to provide skills to our youth. Not only our youth, so if you go on our website, we will have free courses. And now to the foreign front. Survivors from a fishing boat that sank off southern Greece in one of Europe's worst migrant disasters say up to 100 children may have been on board. At least 78 people have already been confirmed dead in the disaster. But many more could still be missing at sea, with reports suggesting that up to 750 people were aboard the vessel. At least 11 arrests have been made, including several Egyptians, on suspicion of people trafficking. Greek TV reports. The Coast Guard has been criticized for not intervening earlier, but authorities say their offers of aid were refused. Rescuers are still searching the area where the boat capsized almost 50 nautical miles off the southwest coast as hopes of finding more survivors dwindle. <laughs> 